Chapter Two. As soon as the agent had gone, Tylo Morgan rang a bell. His man came and lifted him skillfully out of the big chair and laid him on the daybed by the window, propping him with cushions behind his back. Two cushions will be enough," said the squire. "I'm rather tired this morning." The man put the bell within easy reach and went out softly. Tylo Morgan lay back quite still. Thinking of old days and of happy years, and of the bad season that followed them, his first recollections were of a little cottage, snow white, high upon the mountain, a little higher than the hamlet of Castellibuc, of which he had been talking to the agent. The shining walls of the cottage, freshly whitened every Easter, were very thick and sloped outward to the ground. The windows were deep set in the wall, by the porch. Which sheltered the front door from the great winds of the mountain, were two shrubs, one on each side, that were covered in their season with orange-colored flowers, as round as oranges, and these golden flowers were, in his memory, tossed and shaken to and fro in the breeze that always blew in that high land, when every leaf and blossom of the lower slopes were still. About the house was the garden and a rough field. And a small cherry orchard, in a sheltered dip of land, and a well dripping from the grey rock with water very clear and cold. Above the cottage and its small domain came a high bank with a hedge of straggling, wind-beaten trees and bramble thickets on top of it, and beyond the steep and wild ascent of the mountain, where the dark green whin bushes bore purple berries, where white cotton grew on the grass. And the bracken shimmered in the sun, and the imperial heather glowed on golden autumn days. Tylo remembered well how, a long age ago, he would stand in summer weather by the white porch, and look down on the great territory, as if on the whole world far below, wave following wave of hill and valley, of dark wood and green pastures and cornfields, pale green or golden, the white farms shining. The mist of blue smoke above the Roman city, and to the right the far waters of the Yellow Sea, and then there were the winter nights, all the air black as pitch, and a noise of tumult and battle when the great winds and driving rain beat upon the wall and window, and it was praise and thanksgiving to lie safe and snug in a cot by the settle near the light and the warmth of the fire, while without. The heavens and the hills were confounded together in the roaring darkness. In the white cottage on the high land, Tylo had lived with his mother and grandmother, very old, bent and wrinkled, with a sallow face and hair still black in spite of long years. But he was a very small boy when a gentleman who had often been there before came and took his mother and himself away down into the valley. And his next memories were of the splendors of Lantresant Abbey, where the three of them lived together and were waited on by many servants. And he found that the gentleman was his father, a cheerful man, always laughing, with bright blue eyes and a thick tawny mustache that drooped over his chin. Here Tylo ran about the park and raced sticks in the racing Avon, and climbed up the steep hill they called the Craig. And liked to be there because, with the shimmering, sweet-scented bracken, it was like the mountainside. His walks and runs and climbs did not last long. The strange illness that nobody seemed to understand struck him down. And when, after many weeks of bitter pains and angry, fiery dreams, the anguish of day and night left him, he was weak and helpless, and lay still, waiting to get well. And never got well again. Month after month, he lay there in his bed, able to move his hands faintly, and no more. At the end of a year, he felt a little stronger and tried to walk, and just managed to get across the room, helping himself from chair to chair. There was one thing that was for the better: he had been a silent child, happy to sit all by himself hour after hour on the mountain. And then, on the steep slope of the creek, without uttering a word or wanting anyone to come and talk to him, now in his weakness he chattered eagerly and thought of admirable things. 
he would tell his father and mother all the schemes and plans he was making, and he wondered why they looked so sadly at him. And then, disaster. His father died, and his mother and he had to leave Khantrasant Abbey. They never told him why. They went to live in a grey, dreary street somewhere in the north of London. It was a place full of ugly sights and sounds, with a stench of burning bones always in the heavy air, and the unseemly litter of eggshells and torn paper and cabbage stalks about the gutters, and screams and harsh cries fouling the ears at midnight. And in winter, the yellow sulfur mist shut out the sky and burned sourly in the nostrils. A dreadful place, and the exile was long there. His mother went out on most days soon after breakfast, and often did not come back till ten, eleven, or twelve at night, tired to death, as she said, and her dark beauty all marred and broken. Two or three times in the course of the day, a neighbor from the floor below would come in and see if he wanted anything. But except for these visits, he lay alone all the hours, and read in the few old books that they had in the room. It was a life of bewildered misery. There was not much to eat, and what there was seemed not to have the right taste or smell, and he could not understand why they should have to live in the horrible street, since his mother had told him that now his father was dead, he was the rightful master of Flantresant Abbey, and should be a very rich man. Then why are we in this dreadful place? he asked her, and she only cried. And then his mother died, and a few days after the funeral, people came and took him away, and he found himself once more at Rantresant, master of it all, as his mother had told him he should be. He made up his mind to learn all about the lands and the farms that he owned, and got them to bring him the books of the estate, and then Captain Vaughan began to come and see him, and tell him how things were going on, and how this farmer was the best tenant in the county and how that man had nothing but bad luck, and John Williams would put gin in his cider and drive breakneck down steep stony lanes on market nights, standing up in the cart like a Roman charioteer. He learnt all about these works and ways, and how the land was farmed, and what was done, and what was needed to be done in the farmhouses and farm buildings, and asked the agent about all his visits of inspection and enquiry till he felt that he knew every field and footpath on the Hanthrasant estate, and could find his way to every farmhouse and cottage chimney corner from the mountain to the sea. It was the absorbing interest and the great happiness of his life, and he was proud to think of all he had done for the land and for the people on it. They were excellent people, farmers, but apt to be too conservative, too much given to stick in the old ruts that their fathers and grandfathers had made obstinately loyal to the old methods in a new world. For example, there was Williams, Pennerhall, who almost refused to grow roots, and Evan Thomas, Glasscoat, who didn't believe in drain pipes, and tried to convince Vaughn that bush drainage was better for the land, and a half dozen, at least, who were sure that all artificials exhausted the soil, and the silly fellow who had brought his Black Castle Martins with him from Pembrokeshire, and turned up his nose at Shorthorns and Herefords. Still, Vaughan had a way with them, and made most of them see reason sooner or later, and they all knew that there was not another estate in England or Wales that was so ready to meet its tenants halfway, to do repairs and build new barns and cowsheds very often before they were asked. Tylo Morgan gave his agent all the credit he deserved, but at the same time, he could not help feeling that in spite of his disabilities, of the weakness that kept him a prisoner to these four or five rooms, so that he had not once gone over the rest of the abbey since his return to it, in spite of his invalid and stricken days, a great deal was owing to himself and to the fresh ideas that he had brought to the management of the estate. He took in the farming journals and was thoroughly well read in the latest literature that dealt with the various branches of agriculture, and he knew in consequence that he was well in advance of his time, in advance even of the most forward agriculturalists of the day. 
There are methods and schemes and ideas in full course of practical and successful working on the Chantressant property that were absolutely unheard of on any other estate in the country. He had wanted to discuss some of these ideas in the press, but Juan had dissuaded him. He said that for the present the force of prejudice was too strong. Juan was possibly right. All the same, Tylo Morgan knew that he was making agricultural history. In the meantime, he was jotting down careful and elaborate notes on the experiments that were being tried, and in a year or two, he intended to put a book on the stocks, The Chantressant Estates, A New Era in Farming. He was pondering happily in this strain when, in a flash, a brilliant, a dazzling notion came to him. He drew a long breath of delighted wonder, then rang his handbell and told the man that he might now put in the third cushion and give me my writing things. A handy contraption with paper, ink, and the rest was adjusted before him, and as soon as the servant was gone, Tylo began a letter, his eyes bright with excitement. Dear Vaughn, I know you think I'm inclined to be rather too experimental in my farming. I believe that this time you will agree that I have hit on a great idea. Don't say a word to anybody about it. I am astonished that it hasn't been thought of long ago, and my only fear is that we may be forestalled. I suppose the fact is that it has been staring us all in the face so long that we haven't noticed it. My idea is simply this, a plantation or orchard, if you like, of the arborvitae, and I know the exact place for it. You have often told me how Jenkins of the Garth insists on having those fields of his by the sore down in potatoes, a most unsuitable place for such a crop. I want you to go and see him as soon as you have time, and tell him we want the use of the fields, about five acres, if I remember. Of course, he must be compensated, and, within reason, you can be as liberal as you like. I have understood from you that the soil is a deep, rich loam, and very good heart, it should be an ideal position for the culture I intend. I believe that the arborvitae will flourish anywhere, and is practically indifferent to climactic conditions, makes its own climate, as one writer rather poetically expresses it. Still, its culture in this country is an experiment, and I am sure Maharadwes, I think that's the old name of those fields by the Soar, is the very spot. The land must be very thoroughly trenched, Get this put in hand as soon as you can possibly manage it. Let them leave it in ridges so that the winter frost can break it up. Then, if we give it a good dressing of superphosphate of lime and bone meal in the spring and plow in September, everything will be ready for the autumn planting. You know I always insist on shallow planting. Don't bury the roots in a hole. Spread them out evenly within five or six inches of the surface. Let them feel the sun. And when it comes to staking... Mind that each tree has two stakes crossed at the top with the points driven into the ground at a good distance from the roots. I am sure that the single stake close to the tree stem with its point driven through the roots is very bad practice. Of course, you will appreciate the importance of this new culture. The twelve distinct kinds of fruit produced by this extraordinary tree, all of them of delicious flavor, render it absolutely unique. Whatever the cost of the experiment may be, I am sure it will be made good in a very short time, and it must be remembered that while the name, tous les mois, given to a kind of strawberry cultivated on the continent, really only implies that the plants fruit all through the summer and early autumn, in the case of the arborvitae, the claim may be made with literal truth. As the old writers say, the arbor yielded her fruit every month. No other cropper, however heavy, can be compared with it. And in addition to all this, the leaves are said to possess the most valuable therapeutic qualities. Don't you agree with me that this will prove by far the most important and far-reaching of all our experiments? I remain, yours sincerely, Tylo Morgan. P.S. On consideration, I think it might be better to keep the dressing of super and bone meal till the autumn just before plowing, and you might as well begin to look up the nurseryman's catalogs. As we shall be giving a large order, you may have to give it with two or three firms. 
I think you will find the arborvitae listed with the coniferae.